Hey friends, happy Friday. My goodness, this week has been a long one for me, but a good one. I've been having a sick dog the past two nights. I've been sleeping on my couch and getting up like every couple hours with him, but he's doing fine. We'll see if he sleeps tonight. (laughs) So anyways, it's been a little bit of a long week and I haven't had time to do the podcast. So I'm doing it right now. It's Friday night. It's been a great Friday. My husband and I watched a movie and got pizza. I hope you guys have had a good Friday too. And we're going to jump in to Titus 2 today. So I know many of us are familiar with the Proverbs 31 woman, but have you studied the Titus 2 woman? I think she's just as interesting and it's a little bit shorter, so we're going to go through that tonight. (laughs) So a little background of the tiny book of Titus. This letter's theme is the unbreakable link between faith and practice, belief and behavior. This truth is the basis for Paul's criticism of false teaching, his instruction of Christian living, and his standards he sets for church leaders. False teaching would have been welcomed in Crete, which was known in the ancient world for immorality. But Paul expected the gospel message to produce real godliness in everyday life, even in Crete. So let's get into it. Titus 2 says, But as for you, proclaim these things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, self-control, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. First, Paul points out that the church is to proclaim things that are fitting for sound doctrine. So this would be a church that understands the true biblical doctrine. They have studied the word, they are familiar with it, they've memorized it, they've held it in their hearts, they've debated it, and they've discussed it. I once listened to a sermon with a pastor that brought up an interesting point, which I still think about from day to day, but he was talking about, I don't remember it was about the New Testament, but how in the synagogues, of course they had the Torah then, but in the synagogues, they would meet together and debate scripture and no one had access to scripture like we do today. There weren't Bibles everywhere around. They actually knew it so well because they had memorized it. And they were able to pull things out and talk about scripture verses and argue doctrine together from memory. It was so ingrained in them. Scripture was so ingrained in them and their families' lives. They would spend time discussing and debating, maybe just for fun too. I don't know. And that's what a lot of Paul's letters are about. Basically sending out the true gospel message to weed out many false teachings that were mixing Jewish customs with the gospel message. And of course, now today we all have a Bible, of course, partly, I probably largely partly, thanks to the Gideons, <laughs> there's like an abundance of Bibles out there. And we also have obviously it on the internet, on our phones, it's everywhere. But how seriously do we approach biblical doctrine? How much curiosity do we pour into scripture and apply it into our lives? I know I don't have it memorized enough to come up with different debates. I haven't studied it deep enough to get into a synagogue and have a discussion or a debate about doctrine. And sure, we might hear more scripture now. It's common to see a 30-second social media scripture blip. But how much of our time is actually intentionally spent to understand biblical foundation or biblical doctrine? How often do we take the time to sit down and really research why we believe what we believe? And I'll say over the past five years, I've definitely been challenged to do that. There's lots of doctrine that we all know we grew up believing and being taught, but I don't know always necessarily why I believe that. It's because it's what I was taught in Awana or it's what I was taught growing up. But now as a 35-year-old woman, I do need to take the responsibility to sit back and be like, okay, what does scripture truly say about this doctrine that I've been taught? And is this doctrine really rooted in foundational principles of biblical truth? The same thing with new doctrine that's coming around. You see like I said, all different clips on social media, or you might hear a new theory about a new, you know, biblical interpretation. But 
can I defend that based off scripture that I know? Or can I refute that based off scripture that I know and understand? It's just been an interesting thought to really challenge all of my perspectives from what scripture actually says. And of course, this doesn't mean we have to be scholars or go to seminary. This simply means that we approach scripture with the intention to understand, to build out the pillars of the foundation of scripture in our lives. And then we use that foundation to intentionally build that into our families, into our friendships, and into our workplace. All right, so getting back to... Titus 2, ladies. Okay, it says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So reverence is a feeling of deep respect or a feeling of awe. To treat someone with reverence is to show them intense respect. Scripture is saying older women should behave in a way that would gain respect of others. Thus, older women should not participate in or be malicious gossips. They should not be enslaved to wine or, said another way, be under the control or command of wine. An older woman should also teach what is good. And this passage has a so that in the middle. So that they, the older respected women who do not gossip and are not controlled by wine, may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God may not be dishonored. Women pursuing their spiritual maturity, striving to remove sin and make changes in their lives will result in a demeanor of encouragement to younger women. Paul says women should be, which I'm just a little tangent. I'm sorry. Paul has a lot to say about women and he was never married. And you know, I know I'm a woman, so I'm probably extra sensitive about this, but I'm like, okay, Paul, who makes you an expert? You weren't a husband. Is that bad to say out loud? I, I just said it. So <laughs> whatever. But sometimes I think that in my head, but I'm also like, okay, well, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So be that as it may, sometimes I think that, but I also think Paul was legit and I really liked him in scripture. He was definitely like my Bible crush, if you will. So I guess I'm okay with it, but I'm just going to say sometimes it's interesting that Paul has a lot to say about women and he wasn't married. Okay. So anyways, in this passage, it is Paul and he breaks down a few different things that women, young women should be. So one is sensible. I looked up the definition of sensible and I liked what it had to say in regarding sensible of an object. <laughs> so practical and functional rather than decorative. And then it gives a phrase, mom always made me wear sensible shoes as an explanation. Okay, so this definition, even though it's about an object, I think can actually really apply to women. We are not merely decorative. We are functional. We make decisions that make sense for our lives and for our families. We are not to strive to be just ornamental or perfect. We're to be operational, genuine, ready to get to work and make good choices in our pursuit of godliness. Pure, pure, which can be defined as free from moral fault or guilt, which of course we all know we're sinners, even young women, (laughs) and it's only through Jesus that we're free. But I also think the word genuine might apply here with pure, genuine, pure of heart, pure intentions when serving others. You come from a genuine love for people. And then he also says workers at home. Okay, I discussed this whole idea about trad wives, etc. in my least favorite episode I did ever on Tuesday. So you can take a listen if you want to hear more about that. But what I will say about this today is working inside or outside the home. I'm going to speak from my perspective as a woman who's married with no kids, just a couple dogs and a few chickens. We can all choose how much we work at home in our homes and how we use our time. If you don't have kids, you do usually have a lot of say of what you do on the weekends. I'm imagining if you have a bunch of kids, your weekends aren't like too much of what you want to do. It's more what they have to do, right? I don't know. You can tell me. But (laughs) are we using our time at home productively? Are we using our time at home wisely? Is the time we spend at home God honoring? Are we working at home to invest in who and what God has placed around us? Do we set aside time at home to pursue the Lord on the weekends? The other quality that Paul talks about is kind. Having or showing a friendly, generous, and considerate nature, it's also a fruit of the spirit. I feel like we all know what kindness is, so I'm going to keep going. He also says being subject to their own husbands, 
We also see this phrase in Ephesians 5, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. In trying to kind of break this down and write an explanation out for this, I did a little research and I really liked how I came across a blog. It was written by Protestant Reformed Churches in America, and I just, I like how they broke it all down. So it says, now as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wife be to her husband. That means fundamentally you follow his spiritual leadership, but it means also that you desire him and his purpose in life to be carried through. It means that you delight in seeing him prosper in his gifts. Christ, of course, is sinless and a husband (laughs) is not, which we all know, a husband is sinful. (laughs) And yet, as the wife, we will say, I give myself to serve the advancement of your calling in this world, and I delight in seeing you take that calling and glorify God in your calling. You will say to your husband, I delight for you to take the initiative in our family. I'm glad when you take responsibility for things and lead. I flourish when you make sure the family is going in the way of wisdom. There is your husband before you. He is a sinner saved by grace. He has gifts. He has a personality. He has a calling in his life. To submit to him means that you will see it as your place to encourage him. As God's son, to develop him and his calling that God gives him. You will not say, I want my own interests, I want my own life, I want my own career. But you will say, I use my time and my talents for his good and for the good of our marriage. You will honor and you will affirm your husband's leadership and help him carry it through. You were made to be a helpmate for him, to help him be the man of God that God calls him to be. You will then be his counselor. You will be his aid. You will be his helpmate. You will delight that his name to be held in respect through your actions and that through you, he is honored. As the church is to Christ, we want the name of Christ to be honored by our actions. That is the desire of the church. So also the wife will want her husband to be honored as the world looks at her and her actions. The wife then will not run around criticizing her husband publicly, belittling him and telling everyone of his shortcomings, discouraging him in life and what he wants to do. This is a very different picture of marriage than what we see portrayed in the world. And older women who are spiritually mature should encourage young women to practically work these things out through marriage. Okay, I'm just going to do a little marital confession here, and my husband's okay with it. So I will say, I often heard when I was growing up and so excited, I wanted nothing more but to be a wife for my life. I just, I wanted to be a wife so badly that I knew women needed to submit and respect their husbands, right? That's like what we're told to do. But when I got married, I found myself faced with the question, what if my husband makes a choice that I don't respect? Or what if I feel like my husband isn't worthy of my submission? It was a little frustrating to me when I got married because, again, you grow up your whole life excited to be a wife and everyone's like, oh, you just respect your husband, you submit to your husband. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. But no one really tells you what that looks like practically once you get into marriage. And it's a challenge. But I really like the perspective that the blog gave us as a woman When you are encouraging your husband and you're making decisions and choices to invest in him and your marriage, you will honor him and give him the encouragement he needs to be worthy of your respect and submission. And that's one thing I actually, my dad wrote my husband and I's wedding vows, and that is actually one of the vows is that in my husband's vow, it was that he would work to be worthy of my respect. And I don't remember what mine was to him, so I should probably look back at it. (laughs) But I should read them sometime because he wrote, my dad wrote them and I really loved them. Okay, so off tangent, here we go. So we're getting back to Titus and we're met with, again, the phrase, so that the word of God may not be dishonored. And yes, God does not need defending, but I love that this paragraph wraps up with this phrase. All of these things will lead to honoring God. And I would also say, All of these things look so contrary to what the world expects that it might be puzzling enough to spark a question or two. 
and that will give you the opportunity to share how the Lord is challenging and changing you. So ladies, whether a teen getting ready to jump into independence, a woman in singlehood, wifehood, motherhood, grandmotherhood, and everything in between, let's strive to build these habits now to help us grow into Titus 2 women as the years continue to fly. And a few points to reflect on today. How are you developing your understanding of sound scriptural doctrine in your life? Are you utilizing your time at home to be spiritually productive? What young woman has God placed in your life who could use biblical encouragement today? Well, thanks for listening, friends. I hope you all have a great rest of your weekends. You really are an encouragement to me, and I'll be talking to you soon.